I'll just make give them a warm welcome and come back tonight for some more good music. Thank you. Be seated. If you don't have to stand up for me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to welcome everyone to the services this morning, especially want to welcome any visitors we may have. Just ask if you could to fill out the tab on the side of the bulletin and drop it in the offering plate when it comes around. If you're a first time guest of ours, we'd like to welcome you with a special gift bag we've arranged, but we'd need you to raise your hand up really high at this time, and one of these ladies will get that to you. Also, if you are a guest, uh, you might want to check out our visitor center as you leave today, located out in the foyer on the left. Uh, as far as announcements today, the Baptist women will meet tonight after evening services. Also, I was asked to announce next Saturday, we need uh, a lot of help at 9 o'clock, or this coming up Saturday, to work on the up at the hill for the outdoor drama. So if you could be here at 9 o'clock, they've got a long list of stuff they need to get done. And also, if you want to be part of the outdoor drama, if you could see Greg Workman uh, today after services. Where are you, Greg? Back here? He's back here. He's back here. That's what he looks like. So just catch him after services. And also, uh, we need help with food items for the Journey to Bethlehem drama. Uh, th and that is December 7th and 8th. And if you can help with food items, there is some suggestions here in the bulletin you can see amy smithy right after service she'll be right up here in the front and her phone number is also in the bulletin and also uh the tuesday the tuesday daytime reflecting his glory class uh, will meet tomorrow instead of tuesday and that'll be uh, at 9 a.m tomorrow also uh, miss billy speaker she is in the hospital out here she's in room 136 uh, and she will be in the swing bed unit uh, on Tuesday. And also, I did have somebody contact me at work. Uh, they was looking to find a family in need of, and not someone that's just looking to make a money and make a profit. And they needing to uh, find somebody that they have several items like a commode, a hover round, a handicap stand. They have a van. It's an older one, but has low miles. And they have some other stuff, too, and they want to just give this stuff away to someone in need. Uh, their family member died, and uh, his wish was to, for this items to go to someone in need. So if, you'll, if you do know somebody or if yourself needs this, uh, I've got their phone number here. I can share that with you after service if you'll just find me. And uh, also, I think today there's a note in the bulletin about faith comes by hearing. Uh, there'll be donations will be received at the doors on your way out today by our ushers. Uh, it's a veterans faith by hearing ministry using military Bible sticks, which cost $25 each, and any donation will be appreciated for that. That's all I have today. You have any birthdays this past week? Yeah. <laughs> Is today your actual birthday? That's what. <laughs> anniversaries this past week. No anniversaries, I guess. I guess we could sing it anyway, but you know, <laughs> no anniversaries. Uh, that's all I have today. Uh, please, uh, I invite you just to sit back and enjoy the service today. It sounds like it's going to be really great. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for this beautiful day you blessed us with, Father, and we thank you for each and every one that's here to worship you, Father. And Father, we pray for the ones that's not here, Father. We know that there's many that may be out in the deer woods this weekend. We know there's some traveling, and then there's a lot that's ill, Father. We just pray that you'll just uh, be with them, Father, and just help them, and we just pray that they'll be back at your house to worship you once again. We just pray for the continued blessings upon the rest of this service, and just bless for John as he brings the message from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. prayer this morning is that Jesus Christ will be exalted in this place. Amen. He is worthy of our prayers. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we honor you.
praise this morning. Amen. If you don't mind, stand on your feet. Just keep standing. You were doing such a wonderful job of just worshiping the Lord. You know, I love the scripture where Jesus says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. How many of you know that he does? Care for every one of us. We were praying this morning for different needs that the choir brought to us. And, and uh, many of those needs were some of you. And uh, praying that God would just strengthen and would encourage you today. And I believe he's doing that. Uh, my, my wife, this is my wife, Elizabeth. We've been married 30 years as of this summer. And uh, she is, was born in Louisiana. Anybody ever heard of a Cajun around here? <laughs> Do we have any Cajuns around here? All right, we got a few. But uh, This next song we're going to sing is kind of like <coughs> sanctified blues, if you will. Okay? <laughs> uh, it, and it just says this, a very important principle. When Jesus lifts the load, your load is a whole lot lighter. Would you turn around and somebody just say, he wants to lift your load this morning? <laughs> Tell somebody. Go ahead. And when Jesus lifts the load. We need a little more track.
How many have found that to be true? Jesus will lift the load. The load is a whole lot lighter when he lifts it. Uh, this morning, I, I'd like to just leave one more song with you before uh, Pastor John comes. But uh, <clears throat> a few years ago, we had a friend who had uh, brain cancer. And she was such a sharp lady. We knew her well. You may be seated if you'd like. Uh, she was a very sharp lady, like a straight-A kind of student. And yet when, when she started dealing with this brain cancer, uh, things changed for her. And we had dinner with her at one point, and she said, sometimes I try to read a recipe, and I can't read the recipe, but I remember how to cook. And all kinds of challenges that she faced. And uh, my wife went back to our motel room. And she began to write these words that we're going to sing for you now. And I don't know who here this morning you're going through some times where you just, it's easy to say why. Or Lord, have you really forgotten me? You know where I am? Have you got my number? But here's the bottom line. When we come to those times in our life, all we can say is, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. That you know what's best for me that you will help me. You will be my strength. You will be my source. We've sung the older chorus. In fact, we'll sing it a little bit. Jesus, Jesus, how I trusted, how I proved you o'er and o'er. He is our strength, and we can trust him. Amen? Let's look at some. Why, how, when?
Just um, thank you for all that you do for us, and we come bringing back a small portion of uh, what you have provided for us. We ask you, Lord, to use it to, for the ongoing of your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for this church, this congregation. Thank you for your our wonderful preacher and your shepherd. We just ask that you would continue to be with us, for we ask it in your son Jesus. continue to take the offering up I just want to let you know that this is uh, our veterans day service as well I know we have a number of people that that are gone and in the woods and we are praying for them but we're so glad uh, for those who are able to be here today so I'm going to ask any veteran of any branch of service to stand at this time whether you're active duty retired or if you served one day or if you served 25 or 30 years, if you served in World War II all the way to present time, would you just stand? I want you to look around at these men and women. I think there, we usually have a lady or two, but I don't see any today behind me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Nancy, God bless you. Another? Amanda. I'm looking out. I apologize. Anyway, you did camouflage. Uh, it, it is a blessing to have our veterans, and we want to give them a round of applause for serving our country. Thank you so very much. Uh, today, the message, I'll be dealing with some of these issues that uh, veterans come back and face, but we'll be talking about the valley of depression today. Uh, I want you just to, uh, to uh, please, please pay close attention to what's said. We're going to have another song, I believe. Is that correct? 
a DVD. Uh, we have a DVD, that's right. And by the way, this, uh, the Bible sticks that we're asking people to make contributions for, and Don, if we could just have some people in the foyer afterward to take up an offering for this. Uh, the military Bible sticks are a way that we can reach our, our, uh, our, our soldiers in the field, and they can have the Word of God while they are on duty. It's a great thing. It's kind of like an iPod, but an iPod isn't approved, but this Bible stick is approved, and you'll hear that. So, Nick, go ahead and put that in. Courage, honor, bravery. These are the powerful words that describe the character of men and women serving in the military forces of the United States of America. Liberty, freedom, and sacrifice are words which convey the message of independence, a message worth dying for, a message worth living for. Faith is a word that sustains the heart of fighting men and women. Faith in country, faith in freedom, and faith in God. We can uphold the brave and the courageous with a powerful source as they journey into unknown challenges, a source that has sustained the weary, the weak, and the faithful for thousands of years. That powerful source is a living word, God's word. They offer us their best. Should we offer them anything less? Hi, my name is Morgan Jackson, and I'm the director of Faith Comes by Hearing. And I have a unique need that I want to bring before you, and that's the need of military Bible sticks where our soldiers, men and women around the world, can be hearing God's Word while they're in the service. Some years ago, chaplains began to come to us and talk to us about how many of the young men and women serving aren't really readers, yet they need God's Word. And so we produced a military Bible stick to meet their requirements. It's black, so it's camouflaged, has a red light, so it meets the light discipline. And we began to send them. Well, we got stories back where 12 soldiers were sharing one and were coming to Christ as they listened to the Word of God. Soldiers in the hospital who had been wounded were now listening to Scripture and being encouraged and challenged. And so as chaplains began to ask, we don't widely distribute it has to be requested by the soldier, has to be requested by the chaplain. We began to have thousands of these requested and sent out. Today I have requests that are unfulfilled, and we want to fulfill those. It takes $25 to provide one of our soldiers, men and women around the world, in any one of the services, the Word of God in an audio form. Now, inside that, we have a form that the soldier can send back to us requesting an audio Bible for their spouse or a kid's Bible if they have a child. And so the $25 includes that provision. What I'd like to ask you to consider is that each member of your church would take on one soldier and would fund $25 for one of our men and women in the military. If possible, I'd like your church to consider taking on a company, which is 100 soldiers, and providing for those men and women serving our nation the Word of God. If you could do that, that would go a long way to helping us uh, serve our military and reach this need. Your help would be a tremendous blessing. Thank you. That is our strength. How many of you remember the story where Paul and Silas were in jail. They'd been preaching the gospel, and people didn't like that, and so they put them in jail, beat them. And in the midnight hour, the scripture tells us that when they could have been so easily discouraged and just and wanted to give up, instead they began to sing praise to the Lord. And when they did that, do you remember the story? What happened to the chains? I could probably ask one of the Sunday school kids here, and they could tell us. The chains fell as they began to lift their voice in praise to the Lord. 
Isn't that an awesome story? And we're going to sing that story this morning. But beyond that, we're going to talk about today. Sometimes you, sometimes I, face some times when we get to the midnight hour. Sometimes it's literally at midnight, and, and all the pressures that we deal with begin to uh, just pound on us. We were talking with a brother this morning about a brother this morning who was dealing with depression, connected with this church, and yet uh, dealing with just depression. There are those times when the pressures of life will do that to us. But you know what I've found? When we begin to just lift our eyes to heaven and just begin to say, Lord, I'm going to bless your name. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you. Something changes in the atmosphere. The song will tell you the answer. The chains were loosed and they were free. That can happen to you today. As you learn this simple chorus, why don't you just sing it with us and let's bless the Lord this morning. Would you do that with us? Hallelujah. Let's do it. <laughs>
stand as Pastor John comes. Let's just sing that chorus together. I bless your name. I bless your name. can be seated. What a wonderful job. Thank you so very much. We have been talking about valleys and uh, many of you are going through valleys right now. Many of our families are going through valleys right now. We're struggling. I've asked uh, a different individual to speak for each of the series on valleys, and uh, this eve or this morning, my mother was going to speak, but she decided just to write some thoughts out. Now, if you don't know my mom, my mom's an incredibly strong lady. She was institutionalized for almost ten years. Here's some of the things she says. Torture, isolation, alienation. During a conversation with a chaplain at Osawatomie Mental Hospital, she told him, I have lost faith in God. He listened as I spoke and later told me, No, you've not lost faith in God, but you have lost faith in the ministry carried out by Christian people. I believe so strongly in hell as every day and every minute was torture. I no longer felt that heaven existed. His reply was, you believe so strongly in hell, don't you think God has provided a heaven? Years spent in state institutions make me so grateful of the peace that I now feel. The prayers of my mother were continual. When the doctors told her I would be in and out of institutions all my life, she replied, no, she won't. She will be with her children. The Valley of Depression. There are sober statistics about veterans. And I make mention of this because it is Veterans Day weekend. 31% of the soldiers returning from Iraq experience depression. They have difficulty coming back into jobs, their homes, and relationships. The Washington Post had this article and it said, More U.S. soldiers have lost their lives to suicide than in combat. 152,000 Vietnam veterans have taken their lives since the Vietnam War. 
That is a sobering statistic. In 2017, or 2007, 17 suicides occurred every single day by veterans. Dr. Klein said more suffering has resulted from depression than any other disease affecting mankind. My heart goes out to veterans. Returning with broken lives and broken minds. Depression is a deep feeling of hopelessness and helplessness that goes down to the very core of our being. It is a belief that we will never get better, that we will never improve, and there is nothing that you can do to improve your situation. Depression is perpetual discouragement. Men are less likely than women to admit to depression. In fact, two to one, women admit to depression more than men. And unfortunately, too many people have heard sermons by well-meaning preachers who have said some very damaging things. I've heard Christians say, and I've heard preachers say, if you're a Christian, you should not get depressed. How horrible to think that that advice has been given to countless thousands. That is about as foolish as saying, if you are a Christian, you should never have financial trouble. If you are a Christian, you should never have relational difficulties. You should never experience divorce or a disobedient child or become ill. That's foolish. Today, you may be here and you may be depressed. I have news for you. You're not alone. I want you to stand. I want you to hear. Out of Psalm 142, the desperate cry of a lonely, depressed heart is King David was hiding in the cave in Gedi. He cries out with these words in verse 1. I'll mainly read verse 4, but verses 1 through 4. He said, I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before Him. I declare before Him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. In the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me, and no one cares for my soul. Father, I pray today for the desperate and the lonely, the hurting, the depressed, I know, Lord, that it is through your shed blood by your only begotten Son upon the cross of Calvary that we have hope and we have life. And I pray today that you would give us wisdom. Help us to deal biblically with this, but help us also to be very practical in how we respond. I thank you that you always, always desire to give us peace. Lord, help us to seek you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The high and the mighty and the weak and the lowly have experienced depression. A Midwestern lawyer wrote these words many years ago. He said, I am the most miserable man living. Whether I shall live or whether I shall die or whether I shall get better, I cannot tell. Those are the words of Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was at a crossroads in his life and he felt that he was absolutely alone. Uh, The Chicago Tribune put this story out a number of years ago of a young man, this young father. This young father shot himself in a tavern phone booth. His name was James Lee. He called the reporter whom he had sent a Manila, who he had sent a Manila envelope to, describing his life and his condition at this particular time. The reporter who received the call tried to trace the call, but was unsuccessful. The police arrived after this young man, James Lee, had taken his life. He was slumped over in the phone booth. In his pocket, there was a drawing by a crayon. It's a crude drawing by a little girl. And on the outside of that drawing, the words were written 
by that man who had just taken his life, James Lee. He said, please leave this in my coat pocket. I want to be buried with it. It had been folded many, many times, and it was well worn. And on it and in it was the words written from his little girl, Shirley Lee, who had perished five months prior in a deadly house fire. Lee was so stricken by the loss that he asked friends to attend the funeral because no family was alive. The little girl's mother had died at age two from medical complications and he was all alone and she was all alone. For her funeral, he had asked strangers to come So it might be a happy occasion because there were no family members. And then in his will, he willed everything to the little church where his daughter attended. With these words spoken, maybe in 10 or 20 years, someone will see this plaque and wonder who Shirley Lee was. And say these words, someone must have really loved that little girl. It's a desperate cry of the depressed. It ought to break our heart. King David was hiding in the cave at En Gedi. And he cried out and with his condition to Almighty God in the darkness of that cave. He is lamenting his condition. He experiences a danger that is around him. He knows that he is deserted. Look on my right hand, the strong hand, the hand of power. And there is no one there for me. No man cares for my soul. I am all alone. No one knows my plight. No one knows my condition. And cr- David cries out with a cry of dissatisfaction. God, help me. And he gives this declaration, Lord, it is only you. And he cries in verse 6 and verse 7 for deliverance. And then he has confidence, he said, in the Lord. So what does all this tell us? It tells us, number one, that depression is real. Depression is real. Depression happens whether we are Christians or whether we are lost people. And a depressed person may actually be suffering more than someone who's physically ill. Depression can happen to anyone. It's not only for those who are weak. It happens to most. The psalmist didn't hide his depression. He lamented his condition. He cried out to God. He expressed it. But the depression is real and we need to understand that as a church. And physical causes affect us with the depression. The psalmist said in Psalm 139 in verse 14, he said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I will praise you. And we are fearfully and we are wonderfully made. But you know, know, there are things that transpire in our life that are beyond our control. You see, we have chemical imbalances at times in our brain. And when we have these chemical imbalances in our brain, these key chemical substances, these neurotransmitters trying to maintain stability and mood. Sometimes they get off and and people are just not balanced. And sometimes they get incredibly depressed. There are many causes for depression. Vitamin shortage could be a cause for depression. Drug misuse can be the cause for depression. There are so many Ways and so many reasons. Fatigue causes depression. What should you do? Listen to me. Seek medical help. If you are depressed, seek medical help. If your condition is a physical depression, you need to seek medical help. You need to be diagnosed by a physician. You need to be treated by a physician or a psychiatrist, someone to help you through that time. Don't hesitate to check with a doctor. I have known preachers, as I said, with well-meaning intentions to tell people, get rid of your medications. You don't need to see a doctor. Why would God... Give us Dr. Luke in the New Testament then. 
Why would God heal medicinally and spiritually? Why would he do that if we don't need medical doctors? But now I want to get down to the meat of the matter. And here's what I want to speak about primarily. There are spiritual causes for depression. And the spiritual causes for depression are issues that we need to understand. Studies show that depression worsens among those who are hurting those who are divorced, those who are widowed, those who are unemployed, those who have a sense of guilt, those who are lonely, and those who are empty, those who have lost meaningfulness in life to oneself and they have nowhere to turn, they feel that they are all alone, they're spiritually depressed. A lack of self-worth, not feeling that they measure up and that they can accomplish the things that God intends for them to accomplish. All these factors contribute to spiritual depression. Paul cried out in the Corinthian letter in chapter 1 verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to grasp that. He said, I want to give you grace and I want to give you peace. And it comes from my Father. And what you need to do is turn your eyes toward Calvary. And you need to look to Jesus and he will give you strength and he will give you health and he will give you deliverance. That is the only source that will heal us of spiritual depression. Whether or not we want to admit that or not, that's something we have to come to a place and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. In 1 Kings, I want you, you'll see, the, you'll see it on the, the screen, but in chapter 19... Starting in verses 1 and following. Let me give you an illustration of godly people who become depressed. This was the great prophet Elijah. Elijah was a man that God had chosen and empowered. And Elijah became depressed. Listen to what's said. Ahab told Elijah all that Elijah had done and how... He had executed all the prophets with a sword. And Jezebel sent a servant to Elisha saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba which belongs to Judah and left his servant there. But he himself on a day's journey into the wilderness came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die and he said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, and he ate, and he drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. Elijah had just, let me give you the history. Elijah just defeated the 450 Baal prophets. He had withstood against all the spiritual leaders of the time that were leading the people astray. And he had stood against them by himself. And now he is running. He feels he's going to lose his life in verse 3. And when you look at that, he ran 270 miles from Las Vegas. <laughs> All the way to Los Angeles, he runs. And then he gets there and he eats and he realizes, I haven't ran far enough. And he runs 40 more days just trying to get away. And then he hides. And then he goes into a cave and he's hiding in that cave. And and then he cries out in the midst of that cave in verse 9. He says these words. And there he went in the cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God asked him, Elijah, what in the world are you doing here? And he responds with self-pity. Look at verse 10. It said, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I am by myself. Everybody hates me. Everyone's turned their back on me. I am all alone, and only I have stood for you, God. And where are you now? And God listens to his excuses and then he passes by. When you read, he passes by in a windstorm and then an earthquake and then a fire. But you see, none of these move Elijah. You see, when you're so depressed, you don't see the hand of God working. 
All you see is your own condition. You can't get outside of yourself because you're so consumed with what's transpiring in your mind and in your heart that you're in this balloon. You're in this bubble. And you can't see outside of that. And everything is just refracting back toward you and reflecting. And nothing comes within you. And nothing pierces you. And nothing gets in. And you feel that nothing good will ever happen to you. And in the middle of all that, he needed to be seeking God. You see, a circumstance has caused depression. And by the way, do you know what we're leading into right now? Thanksgiving and Christmas. Do you know how many depressed people we see during Thanksgiving and Christmas? People come to me, Brother John, I don't have any money to buy my kids anything. I don't have any money for food. I don't have any money for toys. I don't have... What am I going to do? The expectations, the list goes on and on. You see, the effects of depression are are, are very weighty. Hopelessness, fear of failure, worry, pessimism, irritability, lack of confidence, lack of physical energy, withdrawal from people. But here's the hope. You see, all of those things Elijah was feeling, but here was the hope. And Elijah missed this. He thought life was over, but life wasn't over. He was exhausted. He was emotionally devastated and exhausted, worn down, spiritually empty, but life wasn't over. Verse 12 says these words. And after the earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in it. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And that still, small voice, God got his attention. And when Elijah heard that, as you read, he comes to the very edge of the cave. As God whispered to his soul, he almost comes out. You see, he's drawing close to God, but he hasn't completely drawn close. All the way to God. So verse 15 picks it up and said, The Lord God said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshai, as king over Israel. And Elijah... Elisha, the son of Shaphath, and Abel Meholah, and you shall appoint his prophet in your place. You still have a lot of things to do, he's saying, and then I'm done with you, but you have much work to be done now. Now, I just want to pause and say this. We have a lot of people in our church that have been diagnosed with cancer recently. We have a lot of people that are very sick, and I'm telling you, it's quite depressing to me. It's depressing because some are family members, two of our deacons, teachers. It's very discouraging to me. My heart gets heavy just like yours does. And sometimes I feel like I just can't go on either. And my wife asked me just the other day on Friday evening, she said, what's wrong? You okay? And you know what we as pastors always say? You know what we say? I'm good, good. I'm okay. Everything's good. Everything's good. But you know what? It's not always good. Sometimes you get to that place, you just want to throw the towel in too. But you know, when I come to the edge of the cave and I look out and I look to Calvary and I see hope. And I see my help and I see the one whom I can depend upon totally. I don't want to be, and I don't want any of you here today that are discouraged or depressed, I don't want you to let your depression do what it did to King Saul and Judas. They took their lives. I I want you to understand, if you are depressed, that's okay. But be like Job and Moses and Elijah and Peter and Paul who recognized that God's grace was sufficient and got them through those difficult trials and helped them come through the other side. Now, if you feel like this man that I read about who went to uh, the little restaurant to get breakfast, he walked in, sat down by himself, looked around. He was the only one there. The waitress came over. She said, may I take your order? He said, yes, give me some watery scrambled eggs and some burnt toast and some wheat coffee. And the waitress said, "Uh, okay. Then the man said, well, are you doing anything while the Cook cooks that, and she said, uh, no, not a lot. We don't have anybody else here. He said, well, then would you please come over here and sit down and nag me for a while? I'm homesick. <laughs> Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? 
We feel like I just pile it on, just pour it on. It's okay. But here's two words that I have for you. If, if, if you are in a situational depression, I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm talking about situational depression. Stop complaining. And turn to Christ. Look to Calvary. Lift up your eyes to the hills from which your hope comes. It comes from the Lord. Let me give you the cure for spiritual depression real quick. I know we don't have much time, but I want to do this. Number one, here's what you do. Believe that God is greater than your problem. Turn your problems over to God. The psalmist said in Psalm 41 and 2, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit. You know what? He was in a pit. He was in a cave. But the Lord brought me up out of that pit, out of the miry cave, and set my feet upon a rock, and he established my steps. Listen, when you will come out of that pit and you will say, Dear God, thank you for lifting me up, I am going to stand upon the rock of my salvation. You're my hope. You're my all. Secondly, we need to believe that God has a plan for us. God isn't done with us yet. He has a purpose for my life. And God's purpose will be fulfilled in my life until the day that I go home to be with Christ. I will give my all. Remember, all things do work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. God's not done with you yet. Stay on the wheel. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't back off. Don't quit. Thirdly, thirdly, we not only need to believe that, we need to recognize that depression feeds on self-pity. When we just get the blues and and, then we get down in the pit, we just get lower and lower and lower. And and, and it's a cyclical pattern and and it makes it worse and worse and worse and worse. And we feel like the the little boy uh, in the classroom, the teacher uh, said to the boys and girls, said, Boys and girls, you just need to watch ants because ants tell us what we need to do in life. You watch ants. They are busy, 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 always moving, always working. They work all day. And do you know what happens to the ant when they're through working? Little Johnny shot up his hand and said, yeah, somebody steps on them. (laughs) That's how many people feel. They're just kind of waiting for the other shoe to fall, and they know that what all they've done, and it's not going to be enough, and they wallow in self-pity. Listen, what we need to do is submit to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If we'll submit to God, there is no temptation that's overtaking you such as is common to man. God's faithful, and He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, He will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Listen, I don't care how difficult it is. Trust the Lord. Stick with Him. Realize it will end. And here's the last thing. Again, this is not clinical depression. This is spiritual depression, situational depression. Lastly, get up and face reality. Get out of the bed and get out of the house. Don't just wallow in the mire. Get up and get out. Do something about it. Go to work. Find someone to help. Whatever you need to do, because what we need to understand understand is this sinful thinking is just as detrimental to us as sinful behavior. You're a child of God. Act like it. Philippians chapter 4 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus. Listen, what we need to do is come to that place and say, Lord, I just turn it over to you. And do you know what? The last point that I have is this. Joy. Joy is the opposite of depression. That's what it is. Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. We just need to come to that place where we say, Lord, here I am. Don't become a victim of your feelings. Your feelings are fickle and they do not lead your faith. Let your faith lead you remember God is greater than our feelings and God will overcome those things he is a source of real joy and real peace and until you seek him you're going to have a void in your life Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 says these words a merry heart does good like medicine but a broken spirit dries the bones that's where we need to come to don't let 
your depression defeats you and don't let your depression destroy you. Don't be afraid to seek medical help if it's clinical. Don't be afraid to do that. Realize that God has a perfect plan for you. Take the first step out of that cave today and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm not alone. And I give my heart, mind, soul, strength, and future to you. And maybe that first step today is coming to the altar and saying, Dear God, I just, I just come out and I just ask you to, to deliver me. I know that, that, that I am depressed and I know it's situational. And I know that I have problems going on in my life. And I know that there's struggles. And I know that all of these things are happening. And I know Christmas is coming and Thanksgiving is here. And I know there's not enough money for the month regardless. And now all this is poured upon me and the expectations are too great and I don't know what I'm going to do or maybe you're here today and you're lost and you don't know Jesus Christ and the depression and the oppression of that spirit is upon you and you need to come and you need to give your heart to Christ and you need to find that peace that will release you and give you a future take that step, step out today listen, our only hope our only hope is in the cross and what we need to do is come out of that cave Go through that valley, stay with it, and look to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Would you do that today? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, you know our needs. You know our problems. Lord, you know the valleys that we're in. Lord, you know if someone's here today and they're so depressed, so overwhelmed that they don't know what to do. God, would you do it for them? Would you encourage them, lift them up, and heal them as only you can? And Father, I pray if someone here is clinically depressed, that they would come to us and help, let us help them find a physician or a psychiatrist. Let us give them spiritual counseling. And God, I pray that you would just help us in that. And I pray it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you stand and come as you have needs?